X Nihilo. Talking to <laughs> Mr. Tinker, I've been thinking about how I might introduce you as a geologist who has the Office of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin, or as an energy activist working to move the world out of abject poverty, or as the founder of the Switch Energy Alliance, or as the filmmaker who explored the practicalities of meeting world energy needs. But what appears the most is the idea that you're really an anthropologist of energy, an anthropologist of energy, someone who, for whom the connection between energy and civilization is obvious. And I was particularly impressed by the humanism of your approach. How did you end up in this world? <laughs> I've never been called an anthropologist. <laughs> <laughs> First time. Yeah. I appreciate that. Oh, oh mm -hmm. boy, you know, um, I'm a geologist by training and background, and, and mm -hmm. I started traveling quite young, actually. My family traveled, and then right after college, I went to the former Soviet Union for several oh. weeks in 1982. Mm -hmm. and so in 1982, the Soviet Union looked quite different. Um, and that opened my eyes to the human difference and the importance oh, yeah. of, yeah. of um, tolerance in the world, I think, travel makes us all a bit more aware of, of tolerance, I think. And so, and I've traveled extensively since then, so that's probably the, the human component of that is getting mm -hmm. into, getting in, up to seeing the world and what it really is, what it, what it, not just looks like, uh, Martin, but what it smells like. Yeah, the smell of coal, like in Berlin, we have it, we had it in Berlin too, yeah, the East German part. Hmm? Right. But the smell of poverty. Yeah. The physicality okay. of it is very important to embrace. Yeah. Yes. And the sound of it and, mm -hmm. and taste. And I met a great filmmaker along the way. I'm, I'm the pretty face on these things, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is why we struggle. But, you know, he's the, he's the genius behind all this. But we've been partners at it for over 15 years. And he, and he makes films about many things. Not just energy. He has a beautiful mental health channel. He has yeah. a classical music program. On mm -hmm. Friday nights, yes, he's very broad in his thinking, but we have been doing energy in the private economy, you know, a decade and a half, you know, and then that, you just can't think about energy without thinking about the human component of it, because really that's Absolutely. the human flourishing is what drives all of this. And, and I think I get left behind sometimes a little bit, not intentionally, mm -hmm. but just by our actions. Sure. It appears that the energy issue is on everybody's lips these days, especially in Germany. And comparatively speaking, your perspective we find really unusual. You've traveled to all of these countries, especially the global south, and you've seen just with your own eyes how catastrophically energy poverty affects the population. I mean, you have the physicality of it. So the yeah. senses really come alive um, when you're there. Quite different from a film, which provides a visual and and sound, but you don't get the taste yeah. and the touch yeah. and the smell, and and so that's I think a, a piece of anthropology, <laughs> and mm -hmm. you just can't think about energy without thinking about the human component of it, because really that's Absolutely. the human flourishing is what drives all of this, and and I think I get left behind sometimes a little bit, not intentionally, mm -hmm. but just by our actions. And there's this scene in your film, Switch On, where you're visiting this young woman and she's sitting by your kitchen's fireplace and she's holding this toddler. And it's only because she can cook with dung and wood that everything in this windowless room is like really dirty and sooty. And then a little later we see you with the mother whose coughing toddler is now being examined by a physician. And we learn that 60% of the local children suffer from respiratory elements secondary to breathing in this sooty, dirty energy. Given this increased morbidity and mortality seems pretty indisputable, how do you explain that the majority of our climate and energy activists are following some sort of idealized image of a noble savage who lives a healthy life in an untouched natural environment? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, Stanley, you described that very well. 
Uh, you know, it's, uh, mm-hmm. it was a tough part of the film and it, and it wasn't just there. That's the part we chose to show, but we saw this in many different parts of the world mm-hmm. where close to 3 billion people, a little less now, still cook indoors with biomass of some kind, be it dung or wood or mm-hmm. other things. And in the piece that we showed from Nepal there with Sonic Kanchi, there were actually two cows in that room inside. Wow. These cows were sacred yeah. in Nepal like they are mm-hmm. in India. And the room was very small. Half of it was cows. And that little teeny place was for her you know, five kids. Mm-hmm. And we went upstairs on a little ladder to the small loft where they slept yeah. and they had dry stores of a few things. That was brutal. You know, I go into the study Memorial hospital nearby and watching kids die from breathing particulates and moms with cancer and cataracts and other things. It's brutal. Mm-hmm. And it is so pointless because this is very solvable. This isn't one of those things that we have to work too hard to address. It, we can replace those biomass things, which, by the way, are very expensive to them because they're not allowed to gather firewood anymore. Deforestation, other things are real. Mm-hmm. So you have to replace them with things, whether it's a, a, an induction cooktop, if they happen to have access to electricity or or an LPG tank or other things. And, and the resistance to that is often ironically uh, uh, transparent or Apparent, I should say, <laughs> ironically apparent. It, mm-hmm. We resist giving somebody an LPG, natural gas tank. Well, why? You know, why is that? And, and well, it's a fossil fuel. Well, hold on. Mm-hmm. You know, the emissions from it are significantly less and it's cheaper mm-hmm. to them, liable to them, and we can move it around. And, and so we've got to begin to think a little deeper than the binary narrative that has been presented and in many ways won by one side of that equation, an important one, our, our environment in that is climate, but also the land, the air, and the water. So the whole environment mm-hmm. and human flourishing. How do we, how do we work those together? It's not a binary equation. It's not a yes or no, clean, dirty, good, bad dialogue. It's not a believer denier frame yeah. it for mm-hmm. real, in the real world. It's not, mm-hmm. but that's how it's being presented in some of our more highly educated and rich world. And again, I don't, I don't blame if you haven't been out to see that world or it hasn't been edited to you in a tangible, visceral way. You don't know about it or you might have heard about it, but you don't think it's very extensive. I think we need to do a much better job of broadening the reach of what that real world looks like to all of us. So that yeah. we can then begin to deal with the more complex set of circumstances that exists in that real world and solve it. And young people are sure. smarter than hell. They're going to solve this if they have all of the information and data available to them. But when I lecture at universities and I pick the hard ones, I get lied at kids and they say, I haven't heard half of this. Why haven't I heard this? Nobody's telling me about this. And that's the challenge. Mm-hmm. And they're only getting part of the information. Therefore, they grow up thinking the way they do, that it's very solvable. Just give them a solar panel and a wind turbine and it'll be clean and the world is good. Anybody who doesn't think that is somehow denier or a shield of the oil industry or something like that. It, yeah, yeah. It's just not the way it works. Yeah. And by the way, you know, it's not just in the global South or, or the emerging economies that that kind of poverty exists. It exists everywhere. We have it in the U S you have protests going on in Europe now from farmers sure. with tractors, yellow vests before, and truckers in Canada. The people who produce things are starting to say, enough. This is regressive. It's a bigger and bigger part of my income. The Economist put out an article last year saying that, that expensive energy probably killed more people than COVID the year before in Europe. So it's not, it's not just over there or somewhere. This is around us. In all places, and that regressive component is a very fundamental piece to this. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know that that, the, that those who make less basically have to use more and more of their income for energy and and other things that are equally or equivalently priced, and that's very that's a very real effect of many of these policies. 
Both Hopkins and I have heard you elaborate on the triangular relationship between energy, the economy, and the environment. This is a great lens for positively discussing the safe access and regulation of energy use through policy development, while also providing professional and pro public education on global energy needs, which we find most wonderful. Tell me, did you develop this approach, uh, this approach on your own, or is it part of the economic geology discipline? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I don't think any of us do anything on our own. <laughs> At the end of the day, good we're all point. very good point. We're all influenced, and I've had great influencers, people like Jesse Osabel, uh, who's a brilliant mind, who's influenced many of us, I think, through decarbonization, and many colleagues, Steve Coonan and others. And, um, mm -hmm. But I, the three E's I've been speaking about for a long time, close to 20 years, and and the thing I call the radical middle, I wrote a short piece on probably 15 years ago, that overlap space between energy, the environment, and the economy. Mm -hmm. So and why does that matter? It matters because that's where the action is. That's where it's complicated. When you get in the room with all those things together, you have to compromise, you don't agree sure. on everything, it's messy. But that's where the action is. That's where things will be solved. Because if because you push out from that in one direction, too much toward energy, too much toward the economy, too much toward the environment, you leave everything else behind. And so you end up hurting things and then getting big resistance, rightfully so, from other sectors saying, well, hold on, that all energy all day approach is going to hurt the environment. Or that all zero emissions, zero emissions all day approach could hurt the economy and the energy sectors, and you won't be able to do it. You can't accomplish it. So you have to, you have to bring things together. And that requires well, lots of work, lots of different sectors coming together, NGOs and academics and industry and governments, mm -hmm. as well as different disciplines. It's fun. If you have to have a real broad definition of fun. <laughs> <laughs> we know this story well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't invent it, but I think I've been talking about it for a long time. And I've been mm -hmm. writing about it, and I'm seeing quite a bit of good dialogue around that now starting to happen globally, particularly in, in places like Davos and COP where, where those nations who are just starting along their path or maybe partway into their path are saying, Hey, yeah. hey, hey, wait a minute. You know, Hey, U S you developed on coal. Hey, UK, you did Germany. You did the China is. And Mr. Modi mm -hmm. says the U 20, don't lecture me about climate change. Yeah, yeah. We're going to use coal just like you did because mm -hmm. it's affordable and reliable. And I've got several hundred million people to lift up that are just getting started. So this is the real dialogue that has to happen. The actions that leaders are taking, not what they say, not mm -hmm. what they pledge, but what they are actually doing. And that's the real conversation that I think is so vital to this. Well, and there's a really good point that you make that... You have to use the energy that's available around you to lift yourself up to the next level of energy, which is, yeah, that's important. And yes. following up on Martin's observation that you're an energy anthropologist, even though that's a new notion to you, you really have the sensitivity to culture. Looking at this triangular relationship and how it's relieved out in local populations you go see, I think we're both very impressed with how you work with these population and you help them determine what their particular needs are rather than telling them what you need. And then you have this way of gathering these resources to collaborate, which you're calling fun, um, and help them meet these needs. Is there something in your background that led you to work like this? I mean, do, do you enjoy just having fun with the world or, or what is it? Well, you're, you're giving me more credit than I do. Uh, yeah, I, I like, I like facilitating things. I've done some of those things, but there are really amazing organizations in the world that are going into places and helping with infrastructure of different kinds. Mm -hmm. and what we discovered in our film and what we set out to discover, our first film, by the way, which was filmed in 09 and then released in 12, post-production in 11, was called Switch. And we went to 11 or 12 countries and looked at the best forms, the energy where it was best. 
solar in Spain and wind in Copenhagen and nuclear in France and geothermal in Iceland, except we looked where it was best. And we looked at the pros and cons because they all have pros and cons, trade offs. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, got back together and said, gee, we left off more than left out more than half the world with that film. There are a lot of more than half the world don't have this kind of energy. Sure. Five mm -hmm. million, 60% of the planet at least. And so, and that next film, as we were going along, and we don't pre script these same top things, uh, mm -hmm. we learned as we go. What we learned was you can go in and say, hey, I'm going to give you this thing, some aid, mm -hmm. and you will do this X with it, and Y will be the outcome. And they smile and accept the aid, and then <laughs> it breaks. You know, and it could be something as simple as a fuse yeah. blowing in it. And then you go back to carrying water on your head mm -hmm. or gathering gum to cook over. Instead, what seems to work much better is when the community says to you, here's what we think we need and want. Mm -hmm. sure. How will you work with us so that we will adopt that into our community and adapt as we go to maintain that. And what that does is it builds these little micro and mini markets of commerce. <laughs> and, and by the way, it's things we would never predict. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll give you, yeah, I'll give you a couple of examples in Gunchukwa, Colombia, the Arwako village, indigenous people we brought for solar. They asked for solar. Mm -hmm. I think there's a river right. running. Ah. They asked for that. And there's a river running there. We could have put Pico Hydro in very mm -hmm. easily. No, mm -hmm. the river was sacred, sacred <sighs> water. See, you so are a cultural there. anthropologist, didn't you? <laughs> well, so we, in fact, we were baptized in that river a year before we were allowed to come back, allowed to come back mm -hmm. and bring all. Mm -hmm. There's a, there were power lines four or five miles away now it's throughout the country, but they didn't want to, they don't want it to happen that. They wanted solar and PV solar in the village center, not in the homes, not okay. in the agrarian homes. Yeah. Why? Because people wouldn't come to the village. Yeah. It wouldn't gather. How wise is that? Oh, That's it was brilliant. Incredibly wise. It yeah. brilliant. And their leaders are called Mamos, and we spent eight days that second trip without mm -hmm. electricity helping to, and well, we put in a three and a half kilowatt array, and mm -hmm. and it put it put light bulbs in seven mud huts, ceiling fans in their community center, and one refrigerator region for for some medicines. Now here's the catch. My wife and I paid for the battery, battery pack, $15,000, and it was part of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And we said, you need to replace this in 10 or 12 years. How are you going to do that? They started selling popsicles <laughs> out of the freezer. <laughs> they've never had popsicles because they've never had freezers. Mm -hmm. And they're making money and putting it away to help be prepared. Okay. Now, okay. would I have guessed popsicle sales? No, I I would have been probably the last thing I would have ever have thought of. In Bangladesh, when they got electricity, they built hair salons. The women did. Why? Uh, because it's cultural hair. It's safe. Women gather. Mm -hmm. There's commerce that gets improved. Virtuous. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, then yeah. the women invest back in the community two or three times more than the men who are over there often drinking. That's true around the world. <laughs> 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 and, yeah, yeah. And, and so the 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 virtuous cycle begins. In the Paul we talked about where Sonic Anchi was cooking indoors, at the roadside shops, that's a generous term, a little shack, they now sell induction cook stew. And they're very expensive. I bought one in the film. They're mm -hmm. very expensive. It would be a whole year of income for many people there. But they're selling them now. And she had sold, I forget the number, 10 or 12 that month. Yeah, big deal. That was never part of commerce, but that's what they are starting sure. to do. So what I'm, what I'm getting around to here is that it's vital to listen. You know, that's why we have two ears. What does the community want and need? Mm -hmm. Not what do we, not what do we think they need or mm -hmm. tell them. Mm -hmm. 
In my last book, uh, which is called About the Sea of Air, I recalled that Evangelista Torricelli observes how a barometer's mercury column was more compressed at the base of a mountain than on its summit, from which he concludes that air has weight, and that there must be a vacuum above this sea of air. It turned out that this understanding of a vacuum underlies our modern conception of energy, beginning with steam engine and then electricity. Putting it philosophically, the question of energy is deeply linked to mental abstraction. It seems this ability to think abstractly has been lost in the quest for renewable energies. And there's this primitive belief that the Earth Mother Gaia is noble and good and that she never sends us a bill, <laughs> which is very funny. The metabolism of the vacuum has been forgotten in our times, along with the remembering that everything comes at the cost. Can you explain that to a layman? Yeah. 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 Well, if I'm an energy anthropologist, you're an energy philosopher. Right? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. That's, and it's very wise, what you just said. I haven't heard that put that way before, but that's very wise. Um, nothing comes without a cost. There's trade-offs in every single decision from small to large in the world. If I'm going to do this, I am not going to do that. That's just the way life goes. And the reality with humans is we impact the earth. We do. Everything that we use, even if we're living in what we would call severe poverty, we're still using dung and wood of some kind and harvesting that. And that could be deforestation. Um, not all the way up to the scale of what we're doing right now, which is talking across an ocean in real time streaming. Mm -hmm. And that takes a tremendous amount of energy. So these trade-offs have to be considered as a geologist. I know and understand very few things, but one thing I understand reasonably well is earth resource. So all the things, all the energy collection systems in the world, this is trying to address your answer in a simple way. All the energy collection systems in the world require those resources. Whether or not it's a solar panel, a wind turbine, a battery to store energy, a big cement dam to, for hydro, a pump jack to produce oil, and a refinery to refine it, and a pipeline to transmit anything, all of that comes from here. That requires might. And... I don't mind mining, I'm a geologist, but it's not green. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's There's no green mining. Yeah. Just because we say green mining doesn't mean it's green mining. I don't even know what the word green means anymore. So mm -hmm. it comes from the earth. We make it into collection systems, whether we're collecting the sun or the wind, which are, yes, renewable, but the panels and, yeah. and the turbines are not renewables. They come from yeah. the earth. They get manufactured and they wear out. And mm -hmm. we, what do we do? We dump them back into the earth and typically in shallow landfills. Or we dump the production that when we burn oil and gas and coal into the atmosphere. And then we do it over and over again. So this is a, not a renewable process and it's not a clean process. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we, it's, it's these trade offs between approaches. And, and back to what you said earlier, Hopkins. Um, Everybody has different resources. Some mm -hmm. have great topography and rainfall. Use that. Some have tides. They're on the coast, and it's a good tidal rain or wave action. Use some of those. Some have mm -hmm. wonderful solar. Some have terrible solar. Germany isn't blessed with great sun. Neither is Seattle, Washington. You mm -hmm. know, so it's going to be much less efficient there, and therefore, you have to have more stuff in Germany to actually collect the same amount of sun you would in Arizona. U.S. Sure. Yeah. And this is just the reality of resources and, and energy collection system. There are trade-offs in all these things. The fancy word we use for that is energy density. Sure. It means uh -huh. the bang for the buck. Yeah, yeah, How really? much energy per unit volume or per unit yeah. weight? Yeah. Or even Boslovsville has put it in a surface power density term, which is how much area, how many watts per square meter can I yeah, collect? Yeah. Yeah. So what, whatever your gig is, you recognize that certain kinds of energy just have more bang for the buck yeah. than others. And it's not judgment, it's physics. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so physics wins. Less stuff would get more energy 
at the end of the day, helps the environment mm -hmm. and it helps human flourish because I don't have to have as much stuff to make the reliable energy and all in, electricity is only part of it, the reliable energy needed to power mm -hmm. whatever it is I'm trying to power. And I use that w word power broadly. So to, to, sure. to do useful work. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, is that reasonable? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's a, we, we tend to call that shrinkage. It's the shrinkage of things getting more efficient all the time. The romantic philosopher said uh, that it's not a plus ultra, but, but a plus intra, getting inside in the, in the, in, in the things, which is the very, uh, very question of the vacuum and all this like modern energy stuff, which is getting more out of the bank, like of, of some, some given quality. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'll put some real numbers just right in U.S. terms, but this is true around many modern economies. The U.S. Mm -hmm uses, let's call it a hundred units of energy every year. Turns out that's pretty close, a hundred quad. Mm -hmm. About a quadrillion BTU is about the same as an exajoule, which is about the same as a TCF of gas, a trillion cubic feet of gas. So a hundred units of energy go in. Out of the back end of that, uh, you know, both through generating electricity, but then transportation and commercial, residential, industrial uses. Those are the four big boxes. Sure. Out of the back end of that, we only use a third of that energy to do useful work. Last year, two thirds is wasted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wasted, it. mostly heat out of stacks mm -hmm. and tailpipes. Mm -hmm. And we, so the the headroom on that is really remarkable. There's a yeah, tremendous yeah. amount of, of energy that we could use. Yeah, yeah. Get more use from. Yeah. Now, I can hear somebody listening going, "Oh, yes, but." And they would be right. There's the rebound effect. <laughs> the typical, mm -hmm. if I get something more efficient, then it turns out I do more with it. My computer is more efficient than the one I had oh, yeah. 30 years ago, but I have a bunch of computers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. You know, so it's not one for one. That said, at some point, there's a, there's a, there's an efficiency component. I just use that word, but whether it's conserving or being more efficient, there's an efficiency component to this challenge that I think does not get enough attention. Yeah. Well, and there's something else you're saying there too, Scott, in that, of course, you get more computers. Of course, you get more of this and that. But that's what develops the quality of our life as we move along as human beings. And that, Martin and I, I mean, we talk about this a lot, that gets overlooked. Somehow people don't see that, which is kind of problematic. Uh, so. Yeah, they might. They're probably overlooking it on their cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, no. yeah. So, in your search for solutions to the world's energy needs, you've traveled to more than 60 countries, most of which don't have an abundance of energy, and many are blatantly lacking it. In particular, you talked about, I mean, this tribe that you went to see in Colombia, the Ruko who are indigenous people, suffered massively from colonization and local drug barons and didn't have electricity. And you brought in this micro solar array that they want. As this energy anthropologist who is culturally sensitive, tell us what happened to the tribe suddenly when they had this access to energy? How has it affected their lives over the long term? Yeah. It's a real astute question. Uh, and we were struggling with that even longer we there. Mm -hmm. Is this a good thing? Yeah. Whatever. Because candidly, I haven't shared this with too many people, but you all are probing. The mm -hmm. first morning there, my son went with us. He put that trick together. He was out of college. And, and they got us up way before it all. And walked up the mountain. A very small, wasn't even a clearing. It was a, a place in the woods with a bit of a gap in the canopy of trees, and there was a fire. And about 60 people were gathered from young kids all the way up to the old for several hours. And they explained to us through double translation, our Waco to Spanish to English and back, mm -hmm. about Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. And 
and how important the earth is in all of our lives and how we have to protect it. And I'm synthesizing, which was a very meaningful several hours. There'd mm-hmm. never been a village outsider there. Yeah. So it was a, a very moving uh, time, very powerful time for me and myself. Um, and they presented me with something to sign that said, I commit to communicating and changing this in the world that I commit to everybody in the world protecting the earth. And I sat there uh, unprepared for that. And I said, I can't make that commit. I, I can't commit to protecting the whole world. What I will commit to do is the end of the week, tell you what I'm prepared to commit. Sure. And we went back up at the end of the week to the same clearing and I presented back to them that I would communicate this story to the best of my ability globally. So we have. Mm-hmm. And, and it would be wonderful. They were pushed into those hills 500 years ago by the Spanish in that case. It would be wonderful if the world would continue to live untouched if their lives were that way. Now, what does that mean? Half of their kids die before they become a and have a tooth infection, you know, or diarrhea or something. Yeah, 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 sure. mm-hmm. We would take a full four and be fine tonight yeah. and go have dinner. Okay. So is that good? Nature is rough. Mm-hmm. Nature is hard on it's it's a it's a very hard existence. Um, we have tamed nature in many ways, the modern, Mm -hmm. and not them so much, but us. And so where is this balance? Where is this balance of taking care of the only planet we have and human flourishing so that everybody has a time or be with their kids or read or learn something? I think... Mm -hmm. Most people would like to have that time if they weren't just literally working from the time they woke up to the time they went to bed. Somewhere in there lies this balance. And I think it's what we search for. But it wasn't without struggle. Uh, even sure. there, thinking this is going to improve their lives. And I had to back away. And then I actually said it to our group. Back away and say, this is what they've asked for. This is what we're here to do. We will do it. The, the engineer who helped us do that, Steve, Harding's white pussy, Osiris, is Columbia. So she mm-hmm. does track of that product. And they are using it wise. And it has helped them. They see each other at night. They can mm-hmm. read you know, mm-hmm. in their villages. The kitchen has a light in it. So they can actually cook uh, in the evenings, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. et cetera. So there, there are some nice things happening because it's near the equator. So the days are pretty typically six to six, you know. Long days in the summer and short days in the winter are pretty much consistent. So it really has helped them expand their light, if you will, to do some of the things that we just take for granted. Um, but again, it's not with nothing is perfect. Back, Martin Lee was saying there's just trade offs with everything. Yeah, sure. Well, and we were entertaining this question this morning and talking about it and thinking that the child that's going to grow up in this village with this solar microarray could very well end up going to a university and becoming a quantum physicist. Yeah, but it's, I mean, it's, it's just an abstraction entering like a Trojan horse, is it? <laughs> yeah. It's incredible. No, it you're is. exactly right. In fact, mm-hmm. in Kibra, the large slum outside of Nairobi, where I was with, I was hosted by uh, the lead, one of the lead engineers at uh, Kenya Power. Yeah. Um, but... Mm-hmm. He was a kid who grew up without electricity. He didn't have electricity in his home until the ninth grade or 10th grade, I can't remember. And here he was, an electrical engineer. We laughed about that. He goes, it's so ironic in one generation, really, the learning that went on. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's very astute that that kid could do that. Now, what often happens is they don't come back. Sure. Oh, so cool. And... Mm-hmm. And so I'm working with a young man from South Sudan right now, Aken Paul, who heard me speak once and approached me afterwards. And we've been 
beautiful three or four years now working together he's mm -hmm. made it out of south sudan to south africa un into somehow arizona university now he's here in graduate school in chemical engineering at u of h and i'm i work with him and he started a not-for-profit called seeding mercy and look at uh seeding mercy what he's trying to do is take solar power in this case back to south sudan for pumps to produce water for irrigation. Yeah. He got the government to give him his not for profit 10,000 acres. And then he gifts two to five acres per farmer who can then irrigate it because they have a pump now for the first time. So they can grow mm -hmm. more than their family needs. That's the ideal. And you start to create this virtuous cycle. Mm -hmm. So it happens in ways that are the least expected. Now, Here's the downside. He and I are in correspondence just this last week about what's going on with Sudan and South Sudan. Yeah. And you're probably Civil familiar war. with it, but people are not. It's brutal right now. Absolutely. Six hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. And then they, they're going back and forth and dying. And so he's trying to get money there to help with food. And when we had the philosophical conversation, Martin, about he goes, we're going to try to get food to the women and the old people. And I said, you know, I gave a lecture for two years on ethics way back in my career. And it turns out the great philosophers of the world, when faced with that challenge, who should you save? It's not the old people and the kids. It's the people right in their birthing years because they're not going to die mm -hmm. and they can have more kids. And I shared that with him. He said, I haven't thought about it that way, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you're right. And so we're going to try to make sure those people in their 20s to 40s are the ones that are stay strong and get something so they can continue to take care of the old and the young. And, and it's just this, it's just this incredible dialogue that goes on that we and the, the won the lottery, the first place lottery. Yeah, yeah. It was the year you were born yeah. there. We won a lottery. Yeah. We don't understand these things, but it's happening in our world today, extensively so. Yeah. It's it's very extensive. And that mm -hmm. and that's just, it's not right. This is a P net I'm passionate about net zero poverty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's net apocalyptic zero apocalyptic concept, I would say. In taking an economical look at the energy, and you already talked about it in regards of uh, energy density, you come up with a concept like an energy harvest factor. You've also men mentioned the only real way of effectively dealing with the energy question is giving everyone equal access to adequate energy sources, which in turn eliminates poverty and improves everybody's quality of life. So how would you explain this concept's important to student in geology 101? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think you do it with with illustrations of it. You try to transport ourselves there to what that feels like and what that looks like to have nothing. And once you get that, then you start to see, oh, okay, we all, it's never going to be. But we all mm -hmm. need a level of growth in order to be just. And if you don't have that, you will be left behind. And the disparity that's growing in our world from Elon wanting to walk on Mars to people cooking with dung, we just keep stretching it out. Yeah. And everybody understands that that's, everybody understands that at a gut level, that continued stretch will fail. Through history, it's always failed. The, mm -hmm. the masses rise as they should. And they take the proletariat and they, they cut their heads off, both physically and metaphorically. And so <laughs> you have to begin to, to mm -hmm. bring everyone along. And the brilliant, lucky part of that is it doesn't just help human flourishing. It helps the environment. Okay. Let's mm -hmm. say that again. Wealth helps the environment. Sure, absolutely. Our kids are being yeah. taught that it's it they bad. Mm -hmm. It's not. Yeah. Look where the clean or the yeah. world is. We're rich. Yeah. Look where the cleanest soils and the cleanest yeah. water. Who can afford to clean it up? Yeah, yeah. And who, if you go, it's regulated. And off you go to yeah, yeah. court <laughs> or get fined or worse. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this has a very, a really nice trick. 
you can have both. You can make everybody healthier and more well, and that will help the environment. Absolutely. So that's what I try to get to yeah, 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 is this junk, this and, the energy and the environment, energy and the environment, not or. No. Not or. And, and, by, and by, by saying it's the environment, and the only solution is solar and wind panels and batteries, which is what our kids are being taught. Well, we have to get them to understand what, what energy is, the conversation yeah. we've already had, yeah. where it all comes from, yeah. how it impacts mm-hmm. the environment. And then there's nothing perfect. There are trade-offs. And once they get that, then they can start to move along. And then they go past me very quick. <laughs> mm. <laughs> hey, have you thought about this? No, I haven't thought about yeah. that. Energy density. You... Yeah. Yeah, so this brings us back to this initial question of energy anthropology. And there's this deep connection between energy and civilization. You know, Sumer had Enel as the embodiment of energy. India had their fire god and Agni. And most recent civilization, so there's this deification of what's energetic. You know, as an exemplary, there's Zeus with his bolt of lightning, who was worshipped on Crete as the metallic Zeus. And all the young Greek deities having the second metallurgical birth, like Athena. It's curiously weird how these references have barely been touched on by cultural studies, if not simply forgotten. But they're resurfacing with a vengeance, particularly in this last generation with their indulgence in this apocalyptic thinking about the climate change, which understands humanity as this cancer that's eating away at the Earth Mother Gaia, making me think that we're dealing with this reaction which can only be understood as a religious thing. How would you explain to a climate activist that his protesting represents regression of civilization and he essentially wants to fall back into a pre-modern age? I mean, just he would no longer have his handy, his cell phone. He would have, I mean, how do you explain this? <laughs> oh, well, I was lecturing in, in South Africa about 12 years ago and the 12 year ago at the conference. And at the end, so there was a Q&A period. Somebody said a question. My son was there listening, and they literally said, how do you plan to kill 5 billion people? That was the question. Mm-hmm. What? And I was taken aback a little bit. Yeah. And what I blurted out was, how about you first? <laughs> <laughs> Very good, yeah. yeah, yeah. And my son's like, you can't say that. <laughs> I said, well, what came to my mind? Because mm-hmm. what I think happens is we're always thinking it's going to be somebody else yeah, yeah. that has to make all these sacrifices. Mm-hmm. And so you don't explain it very well to somebody as you frame the question, I think, on a cell phone, et cetera, et cetera. Because nobody's going... Nobody wants to and probably will give up those things. Some mm-hmm. of our most ardent climate warriors travel the most of yeah, any yeah. human on Earth. Mm-hmm. And we all know what flying on an airplane does. Mm-hmm. We all know what staying in motels and hotels does, etc. So very few people are willing to lead by example. We all think of ourselves as exceptions. Everybody else should do these mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. And everybody else won't do those things because word. <laughs> and and I, so I, I come back with that. Some look, some people, and look, I don't think of the world linearly, but if I just do that for simplicity, let's make it a bell curve. And there's kind of mm-hmm. one sigma in here in the middle, 66%. I can work, try to work with that. And two sigma gets me out a little further. Then you get out to three, four, five sigma. Uh, intractable on any on any side but it's not just environmental it can be energy it can be you know pure pure economics only driven <laughs> adam smith the economist whatever but it's in intra- and if some people are just intractable most people are not and and i think when you, what i tend to do uh, hopkins is look for a commonality what things do we agree on mm-hmm. let's frame here let's see where we agree and usually there's quite a bit and now let's talk about a little bit more marginal. What are we having some trouble with? What what can I learn from you? What can you learn from me? And maybe we'll converge a little bit. 
and start to compromise, find ways that it won't be perfect, but we can certainly um, make improvement. And that's where I think going to the extremes is the, an approach that fails. It just sure. doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we geologists love these ternary diagrams, the triangle diagram. <laughs> Everything mm-hmm. has to sum to 100%. And, in, you know, in solution phase and geology, you have certain elements in the minerals and they make certain rocks or, yeah, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that works. But in the world, it doesn't really work that way. But let's pretend like it does. The energy, the environment, the economy. If if I have 100% zero emissions, that means I have 100%. That means I have 0% energy and economy on yeah, that yeah. triangle diet. Mm-hmm. And, and that and that fails. Um, mm-hmm. So you've got to come into that center part where you have blends of different things. I can't, I will not address Germany's uh, reliable, affordable electricity needs by painting Germany in solar panels. Yeah, yeah. I just won't. There's yeah. not enough sun, Absolute. especially in the winter, and you're going to need the land for other things. And by the way, somebody else is mining and making it on and on. Yeah, yeah. Now, it yeah. can be a good supplement, but it's just a piece. So let's let's start looking for those different components of the solution. And this gets to some real practical economics. <laughs> um, markets love options. Okay. Optionality is critical to market success. I don't care if you're buying stocks, you don't buy one stock and throw it all in or, or real estate or energy. We love, we need energy options in our world. Absolutely. And that therefore when some are stressed, the others come in and they backfill and they complement one another. Mandates, which so many political leaders are fond of these days, especially in the West and extreme incentives that pick winners over others are essentially eliminating options. Yeah. yeah. To yeah, say yeah. we're going to take this option away and that option because we know the answer is this. No, no. Markets like optionality. Markets don't like limited limiting options. And that's a hard lesson to learn, but we seem to want to learn it over and over and over again. <laughs> and, and so on we go. One over one again. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, for me, it's absolutely strange how digitalization hasn't been acknowledged in our current climate debate. I find it extremely curious how people ignore that in the 1950s, a silicon chip had only just five or so, six circuits on it, while computer chips now have billions. In fact, every smartphone owner has a higher energy density in their pocket than was available to NASA uh, on its moon flight. And if you look at the great radical impact of data collection in agriculture, particularly in irrigation, fertilization, not to mention vert- vertical farming, you can also imagine the roles that machine learning and artificial intelligence will play here. You might even say that the solution to the energy question is actually imminent in the computer chip. Surprisingly, however, Germany hasn't even tackled the smart grid, which is indispensable for the energy transition out of concerns over data protection and the general reluctance to embrace digitalization. How do you explain that? <laughs> oh, that's a, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And it's a great framing again. Oh, I haven't heard these questions, so I, I'm processing using, mm-hmm. you know, fortunately what NASA had when I was alive 10 years old when we landed on the moon, they had humans that had good minds. Exactly. Yeah. There, there yeah. was it's, that process going on. We weren't just dependent on something automated. We can't lose that uh, out of this equation for sure. But it, three of my four kids are in data science. They're all. Oh, yeah, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> Computer <laughs> science, one, data like my science, son. one's. Yeah. yeah. Engineering and physics, and they just, they're in this world. And the other one's a geologist, and he does big time data too. So they kind of all are. Um, they help bring me along. Come on, Dad. Data you know, mining. Now the new way. Yes. Yeah, mining mm-hmm. my limited data here. Uh, partly we explain it because it's such a black box to most of us. Like I used to, I used to be able to tune up my '78 Camaro, Chevy Camaro. Okay. I could change the spark plugs, change the oil. You know, I could change the, pu- the fuel filter, and I knew what was going on. I can't mm-hmm. touch my current internal combustion, and I would 
markets. It just changed. So it's kind of a black box to me. And I think people worry about black boxes. Exactly, yeah, I think yeah. they worry that I don't know what's going on there. Yeah, it's not and I like it. Yeah, it, yeah, it's 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 this thing. And you know, we've been talking, and I have my phone here, and I didn't put it on airplane mode or turn it off. Mm-hmm. I promise you, I will get some feed based on some words we've said in this dialogue that I never that I don't care about. But it hurt me, and it will it will give me a feed. And I think people are quite worried now about the whole being listened to. I know in Texas now, Texas, you know, we're pretty independent here. <laughs> we 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 like our liberty. So, you know, you're not going to put a smart beer in my house, and and so you know what I'm doing. And, and this is kind of a liberty thing to some people. It, 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 they don't want the government knowing what they're doing. As opposed to thinking about, well, if you ran your dryer automatically at three in the morning, you would you would be using electricity when we have it, and and maybe we could charge you less for that electron, and you'd save money. You know, we just have to put it in terms that are practical and very useful and usable. Um, because AI, particularly AI, it just has a remarkable positive power to it for us if we use it wisely but it is terrifyingly dangerous as well when you listen to those who know the most about it give lectures and they are scared and if they're scared i'm kind of worried too martin and so it's this dance we're doing with this thing with great potential and this thing with great destructive potential but I was how just, do we man? I was I was just wondering about this de- energy density question. Why this argument was never ever like posed? For example, like the silicon chip in a way, like it's 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 an answer, uh, and it's kind of forgotten. That's kind of weird to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I, I don't. It's when I did a TED talk a few years ago. I started it off <laughs> talking about food. <laughs> You know, and, and I talked about, we're in Texas, so I talked about kale and cows mm-hmm. and kale and cows. And, and I love kale. I actually do like kale. I love cows and I do cow, you know, but not as much as what, but we need, you know, this one's really dense and this one isn't dense. This one has vitamins and minerals that are good for me, but I'd have to eat a well of it to get the cal- calories that I need every day. And just the trade-offs with food. And I and so we were thinking, and then I took him into fertilizing all that, the water for it, and the runoff, and, and the rotting agriculture, and the CO2 emissions, and kids don't think about all these things with agriculture, and, and kind of woe would add the energy terms that way. You have to meet people where they are, and what they digest and understand, I think. Set okay. analogies that are not so out to lunch that they're wrong, but reasonably yeah, reasonable analogies and let us process what that means. I I often carry a little pellet around with about that tall and that wide. It's a nuclear, it's a uranium pellet we put it in a fuel rod. Mm-hmm. It's not really one size of one. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and, and I can pull that on my pocket and I say, see this little thing, it's a uranium pellet to somebody. And that goes on a fuel rod. The energy density in that little pellet yeah. is the equivalent of the energy needed to drive your car yeah. from New York City to Los Angeles and back to Dallas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. One little pellet. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know how much gasoline that would take? And they all do. And gasoline is one of the denser fuels compared to... So it helps us start to understand this concept of bang for the buck yeah, yeah. and how little impact environmentally it takes to get that uranium, make it into a pellet, stuff it into a fuel rod and let it create heat so it, it's just analogies you meet people where they are try to work with them without and again not being condescending it often and i can't be condescending i just don't know enough but some people are really smart <laughs> and so mm-hmm. you know they talk to you and you think okay i don't understand what you're saying and they don't bring it down you can you to make it accessible I mean, it really needs to be accessible but for us to be able to get in that radical middle or work together on these things. Otherwise, it's just fear. You know, we have people who are great at peddling fear. 
And fear is a very powerful motivator. Yeah, yeah. We are emotive mm-hmm. people. And, and when I'm scared, I will do almost anything to protect myself and my family out of fear. And that's what our young people have now is fear yeah, for the absolutely. future. And the lack of vision, yeah. the future vision, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's no story told anymore about the future, which is really seducing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Are you familiar with the, it was the first time it was held last October in London, the ARC, the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship? Yeah, I heard about it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was kind of center, center right, I would say, politically, but they had gathered 1,500 people from 70 countries. And there were, there were people in you know, faith and family. There were people in agriculture and food, people in education, energy and the environment, religious people uh, from the Vatican, the musicians and poets, and all gathered. And, and trying to think about how to communicate a new vision, a, a hopeful vision. Because when you actually look at the data, like like Hans Rosen's beautiful book, yeah, yeah, Fact, yeah, 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 right, mm-hmm. and the things that are, yeah, yeah, that are, you're wrong about the world. They're better than you think. Yeah, yeah. The data for the rich world, I want to be clear here, for the rich world, they're so much better than they've ever yeah, been. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, but we don't think so. Yeah, yeah. Why? They're we're, we're depressed. And then you go to the other extreme emerging world, and they have nothing. Yet they're hopeful. This is the this is the strange thing. Yeah. There's this optimism and hope coming out of people that are living in abject poverty because they see a future that is brighter than the one they're in. And and where does that balance happen? Where's the tipping point when we have too much? And now all we do is worry. Yeah, yeah. And that and and that makes this it's fertile ground for fear more. And you know the people that are out there selling fear. They're very good at it. And I, I, I don't I don't appreciate it. Yeah. I think it's wrong. Yeah, have courage. The, the real strange thing, which we keep coming back and back to, is this notion of the Earth Mother Gaia and this romanticization of her. People forget that she was a very vengeful goddess. I mean, she was not kind at all. And so there's this notion of a noble savage living in harmony with Gaia is... I mean, it's a fantasy, so uh, you know, and I suspect you're pretty tuned into Germany's energy situation, where the so-called energy transition policy has become a shining exemplar of a misguided policy for energy. And it's, as we talk, it's because they're virtual signaling this notion of purity and high moral standards in the aftermath of Nazi times. And so they've shut down nuclear plants. They ban CO2 capture, even though they developed the technology. And because they don't like fracking in Germany, despite having this huge reserve in northern Germany, they buy liquefied natural gas from poorer countries with the effect of it threatens Germany with deindustrialization, which we're seeing now. And it does not help global warming in the slightest. Now, I'm a native Californian, and I think that my state has been drinking this Kool-Aid, right? So as an economic geologist, looking at this triangle of energy, economy, and environment, how would you address Germany's situation and my future concerns for California? Yeah. But you laid it out very well. You know, it started started 15 years ago or so. Uh, I won't pronounce it right, but energy bomb, the, the energy policies oh. of Germany. Uh, on the North. Energy and the, <laughs> Yeah, yes. Yes. <laughs> energy bomb. <bandit>. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, you know, the, the thought nuclear is scary. I had, to, I had to try to get my head around why that is in Western Europe as much, particularly the northern part. Mm-hmm. But it seems to be. So the reactors, the plan was to shut them down. And then, of course, Fukushima Daiichi happened, and that accelerated that plan very suddenly to the point where there were just three left a year, a few years ago. And then, of course, the natural gas and Russia connection is broken, mm-hmm. and Germany doesn't have gas for base of power again, like it did. Horn has to say, okay, 
what are we going to do? Because the wind doesn't always blow and the sun isn't that great. So rather than keeping three nuclear reactors going, shut those down as planned and increase coal production. 13% jump two years ago and continues mm-hmm. and importing electricity instead of molecules. Now we're importing electrons, which is yeah, yeah. a little risk as well, depending on who you're getting them from. And then I just read a couple of weeks ago, coming back to the thought of natural gas power plants again. So the circle is complete because there's LNG until our president says, well, we're not going to export it yeah, to yeah. you, which is a policy that makes no sense than anybody I've ever spoken with other than Bill McKibben, who was the architect of that with John Podesta. It makes sense to them because they want to kill oil and gas for good. And they don't really care, I guess, about the rest of the world, including our allies. But that said, um, so Germany is in this predicament of clean thinking, really remarkable desire and intentions that are good, yet a lack of real dialogue around the optionality and the physics yeah. that are needed for this kind of electricity generation to keep you healthy. And you are losing industries and you are losing company and your farmers are protesting and your, your government, you know, are go- they're going to get thrown out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Eventually. Yeah. Got out. Mm-hmm. And you're not alone, by the way. It's everybody is an easy case study in some sense. And by the way, this is a hindsight for me. I started seeing this about 15 years ago. In talk. Yes. Yes. And yes, people yes. were saying to me, You can't, you're going to be, you're so wrong. Or it's, I, 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 I hope I am wrong because I don't want this mm-hmm. to happen. This isn't the desire to be right. Mm-hmm. But here's what's coming in your time it has. And I'm not open with that. Justin Trudeau follows in Canada. Um, you've got parts of other Europe, you know, I don't know. Macron comes and goes and like a pendulum. I don't know which swing he's on these days. Uh, you're head of your DU, she's wanting to ban, you know, combustion. Mm-hmm. So there's this disconnect between economic reality and what's needed to run that engine and the climate. Problem is <laughs> you don't help the climate when you put your when you when you figure on it. Sure. This is the counterintuitive piece. Shutting down industrialization hurts the climate. Absolutely. Yeah. It just means other people are going to make your stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Asia is making your stuff. Yeah. They make our stuff. Outsourcing and they're burning the coal to do it. Yeah. It's outsourcing yeah, so that's the problems. Right. And you're outsourcing it to our yeah. one atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not like it's I'm dumping something in the local river. Yeah. It's one atmosphere. So when Bangladesh and Vietnam and, and you know, India, and China and others are burning coal, more and more coal to make our stuff. And they're laughing because we're basically ending our whole market over or our, our, our manufacturing over to them so they can feed our mm-hmm. markets. I just think they're, they're laughing. Or Xi and Modi and Putin go to bed laughing every night that we're willing to do this to ourselves in the name of something. But it doesn't help the climate. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to keep saying that. Germany losing Volkswagen. Germany, you know, losing Siemens. It's a, it's gone down to 6 or 7% in yeah, the yeah. industrial generation the last two years yeah, in a row. These are huge numbers. Yeah. It's not that that stuff isn't being made. It's being made mm-hmm. somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so I can say I'll be green. And just buy all my stuff. But you'd think the lesson would have been learned with gas for Russia. What if they say, well, we're not going to send you your stuff? You know, because mm-hmm. what's happening is this whole economic fancy thinking of, well, we'll put a carbon tax on at the board. Yeah, yeah. And that's how we'll do it. And, and you, you're going, mm-hmm. are you kidding me? You know, China will just send their stuff to India. The 1.4 billion people there yeah. who don't have a border tax. Yeah, you're not yeah. that relevant anymore in Europe yeah, yeah. and in the U.S. I don't mean that to sound like it just did. You're relevant. We're relevant. But we're coming less relevant. We're 700 mm-hmm. million people combined in the U.S. and Western Europe. 700 million. Maybe not mm-hmm. even that. 
It's a relevant point, Scott. That's like you 7% of the population. You know, mm-hmm. 92% of the people in the world don't live in Western Europe and the U.S. No. And they're going to, they're growing. Mm-hmm. So do we want to be part of that growth and help them and help us and help the environment mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or not? Mm-hmm. Come out of poverty, help the environment. And this is just that it flows in that order. Energy, the economy, the environment yeah. flows that yeah. way. You can't skip it. Yeah, it's kind of metabolism, it. yeah, sure. If you, were, if you were a science fiction novel writer and had to write a science fiction novel in which the society of the 22nd century has mastered the energy problem, what would it look like? What technologies are there? And what would be the, the question that the science fiction author would have to solve mentally? <laughs> well... I get that I get I get asked this a lot, not that way, but I say, people use the say, So what's the answer? <laughs> I said, well, the answer varies where depending on today varies where what are your resources, your mm-hmm. political regime, your economic regime, your educational levels, blah blah blah. Every part of the world has different transitions now. But you took us out to the twenty second century just now, if I heard you right. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. we're we're a hundred years in the future, let's say. Um Physics wins. <laughs> Physics and economics mm-hmm. win. So dense wins and affordable, reliable wins. Fortunately, we have that. Yeah, it's nuclear, you know, there's is it? Not dense energy mm-hmm. in uranium and thorium yeah. on the fission side, and mm-hmm. in hydrogen on the you know on the on the fusion side, we have it. And so, yeah. if with at the end of the day, I think you will see a a very low emission system with very high density electrons being generated in very small footprint areas. And we will mm-hmm. be electrifying quite a few things, but not every. We still need molecules for a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. And so those electrons will help us generate some of those molecules from, from splitting methane to make hydrogen so mm-hmm. we can burn it to get enough heat to make cement and steel. And the cement and steel processes will improve tremendously. And we'll be using more of the, we'll, we'll figure out ways to use more and more of the cement and steel over and over again. So it becomes a little bit more circular. Not completely, but more circular. So you end up, it's very solvable out there. Yeah. A century is much easier than 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> 